He was one of the country's most respected judges who went from the bench to behind bars. The first judge in Canada ever to be convicted of murder. Sentenced to life in prison for killing his wife. When we charged him, yes, he was guilty. That's it. Now, from behind the walls of a maximum security prison, Jacques Delille, for the first time... Mark Kelly. How do you do? ...tells his story about what happened on the day his wife died. You lied to the police. <laughs> you, you didn't tell the truth to your family for a long time. So no. why should we believe you today? <laughs> because I'm telling the truth today. It's as simple as that. A joint CBC Radio Canada investigation raises disturbing questions about some of the key forensic evidence used to convict him. You have doubts. Yes, I do. There's reasonable doubt here. I'm Mark Kelly, and this is The Fifth Estate. November 2009, a quiet Thursday morning in Quebec City when a 911 call came in. The voice of the caller shook. He asked, what do I do? He told the operator he didn't know what happened. The operator asked, why would his wife take her own life? When the ambulance team arrived, the woman is found lying on a sofa, a bullet wound to her head. When the paramedics attempted to examine the victim, the man told them it was too late, saying it was her wish to die. The victim was a 71-year-old woman named Nicole Rainville. And the distraught man who called 911? None other than Jacques Delille one of the most respected judges in the country. It was an unlikely ending to a marriage that had lasted almost 50 years and the beginning of DeLille's fall from grace. Jacques DeLille was an ambitious law student when he met Nicole Rainville. They married in 1960. DeLille was a dashing figure and a rising star who went from lawyer to Quebec Superior Court judge and then to the prestigious Quebec Court of Appeal. He'd count among his friends powerful and influential figures like Pierre Michaud, the former Chief Justice of Quebec. He was a fantastic colleague. I mean, he was the, such a devoted judge. He was a real judge. He was a great judge, actually. He was so determined to render justice in the right way. But for lawyers who had to plead their case before DeLille, it was a different story. They described him as being arrogant and aloof. Jacques La Rochelle is one of Quebec's top defense lawyers. He says it was intimidating to be in DeLille's courtroom. He did not let pass any mistake. That's mainly for what he was known. And if you pleaded before him and uh, committed a mistake, uh, even slight, a slight one, you would stand corrected immediately. But the life of the star judge and his loving wife changed dramatically on her 69th birthday. Nicole Rainville suffered a stroke, leaving her partially paralyzed, forever changed. There were no more light in her eyes, no more. Her daughter Hélène says her mother sunk into depression. She couldn't do anything, cook, read, play bridge, uh, take care of the grandchildren, drive, uh, walk, speak. She was very, she... very active, and then suddenly she couldn't do anything. She was no longer the person you no, remember. No. no. Two years after her stroke, Nicole broke her hip. Delille then retired from the court in order to take care of her growing needs. You know, everybody was raving about the way he was so devoted uh, to her. You know, the most revealing fact is that he adored his job at the appeal court and he retired one year before the uh, compulsory uh, year. For what? For taking care of her full time. Nicole hated being a burden and would make comments about ending her own life. 
dark and disturbing for her daughter Hélène, son Jean and his wife Dominique. For me, my mother... Hélène remembers that fateful day when her father called to break the news Nicole was dead. I asked him, uh, did she kill herself? And he said yes. The first thing you thought yeah. was, did she kill herself? Yes, yes. At first, it certainly looked like suicide, but police began to take a closer look at the case. One of the investigators noticed a black spot on the palm of Nicole's left hand. Was she trying to shield herself when she was shot? With that suspicion, the investigation took a remarkable turn. Police began to secretly follow the retired judge who had been a pillar of justice in the province. That's when they discovered Dalil was leading a double life. He'd been in a relationship with his former secretary for years. Bit by bit, police built a case against Delille. Charles Levasseur, then a Crown attorney, remembers being asked to take the case, and he was stunned to learn the name of the prime suspect. My answer was Jacques Delille, the judge. He said, yeah. And I thought about it for maybe half a second, and I said yes. When you saw the evidence, what, what stood out for you as, you as you looked at the cold, hard facts of this case? It was a first-degree murder. As the police quietly pursued the case, DeLille had no idea he was even under investigation. It had been seven months since the death of his wife, and he was ready to move on with his life. So he asked his longtime lover if she would leave her husband and move in with him. But it never happened. Days later, June 2010, the former judge was arrested and charged with murder. A Quebec judge has been charged with first-degree murder in the death of his wife, the most serious charge ever leveled against a Canadian judge. It was a shocking development for his friends. I couldn't believe it. I, I mean, I, I thought it was ridiculous. I was stunned. And his family. We, we didn't understand what was going on. It was a shock, completely. The trial in Quebec City began in May 2012. From the beginning, it was a spectacle. People would line up every morning, hoping for a seat in the courtroom, hoping to learn more sordid details about the secret life of the once untouchable DeLille. The public was now judging the judge. It was huge. It was huge. It was on national media and in international media, too. It was everywhere. A key area of contention was that black smudge on the victim's left hand. It was gunshot residue. But how did it get there? The defense said it came from the gun Nicole Rainville was holding as she pulled the trigger. The Crown said she got the burn mark as she tried to defend herself from her husband as he pointed the gun at her head. Why in the world? would this man have shot and killed his wife? Well, the, the, the crown theory was this. Uh, Mrs. Delille was, uh, was sick. She was disabled. She was paralyzed from one side of her body. And uh, Mr. Delille was uh, in good health. He was good looking. There was, uh, there was another woman involved. He killed her in order to uh, start a new life. And as the trial proceeded, the Crown focused on the mistress and the money. They claimed if ever DeLille divorced his wife, he'd lose more than $1 million in a settlement. His family didn't believe a word of it. They were furious at how DeLille was being portrayed in the media as a murderer. His daughter-in-law, Dominique Marceau, attended the trial every day. I just felt that they wanted to portray him like a monster, like nobody wanted to talk about the dynamic between Mr. and Mrs. Delisle. They just wanted to portray a, a monster. The fact that he loved another woman, the fact that he had money, the fact that all those things became important and not the facts, uh, I didn't understand. For his defense, DeLille hired Jacques La Rochelle, the lawyer who had faced him many times as a judge. La Rochelle was confident he'd win. The facts, he said, were on his side. 
I quickly realized that there was a huge gap in the ballistics evidence. I, I was sure that it was a suicide because the ballistics proved it beyond a, a doubt. This is what I believed from the beginning. The trial had gone on for six weeks. 29 witnesses testified, but many observers felt the case would turn on the testimony of the last witness, the one everyone wanted to hear from, Jacques Delille. But on the day he was scheduled to take the stand, a bombshell. Delille had decided instead to stay silent. The former prosecutor was stunned. What do you think the impact was of his decision not to testify in his own defense? The impact, I think, was huge, it was very important, very, very, very important, because everyone was asking, the, 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 the Crown evidence raised a lot of questions, and everyone was hoping that Mr. Delil would, would take the stand to answer and to say, look, I didn't kill Nicole. Delil's own lawyer says his case took a major body blow. I was convinced it would be very dramatic, it would uh, influence the jury. I was convinced he would be believed because he, he told the truth. I felt that I had lost an important argument, an important part of my defense, a very important part. It took the jury just 15 hours of deliberations before they returned with a verdict. They found Delille guilty of premeditated murder the 77-year-old former judge was automatically sentenced to life in prison with no possibility of parole for 25 years. His family left the courtroom stunned. His lawyer refused to answer any questions about why his client didn't testify. When we come back, from behind the walls of a maximum security prison, Mark Kelly. Jacques Delille finally breaks his silence on his case and his conviction. There are innocent persons in prisons. You have one in front of you. saint anne des plaines Penitentiary is a short drive from downtown Montreal. But for inmates here, it may as well be a world away. It's a maximum security facility, home to some of Canada's most notorious killers and one unlikely inmate, Jacques Delille, the only judge in the country ever convicted of first-degree murder. For the last three years, he's been here serving a life sentence for killing his wife, far from the courtrooms where, as a respected judge, his word ruled. Now his every move, his every phone conversation or meeting is strictly scrutinized. Once an arbiter of the justice system, he's now a prisoner of that same system. The Fifth Estate and our colleagues at the Radio Canada program Enquête secured an interview with DeLille. Mark Kelly. How do you do? Very well, how are you? We met at the prison. <sighs> Thank you very much. Why did you want to speak to us? Because it's about time that people know the truth. It's about time that uh, I uh, tell what really happened that morning. Once dashing and aristocratic, Delille is now frail and gaunt, revealing his age and the reality of his life. He's 79 and not eligible for parole for another 22 years. Do you feel relief in being able to tell your story? Yes, yes, and I hope that uh, people will understand. Delille wants people to understand the story of his relationship with his wife of 49 years, Nicole Rainville, and her downward spiral after a stroke and a badly broken hip. Objectively speaking, the life wasn't the same anymore. In my heart, she was still my love. But in our daily life, it wasn't the same anymore. Why would she want to commit suicide? Nicole wasn't the same person. I never saw, never saw Nicole smile after her fall. I 
In the course of an hour-long conversation, Delille would reveal a secret that he's carried with him for years and make a confession about what he did on the day his wife told him she wanted to die. We had a real uh, conversation between Nicole and I. I tried my best to convince her not to do it. I told Nicole, I still love you, Nicole. I'm here to take care of you. I repeated that. I, I cry with her. I hug her. Uh, I kiss her. I did my best to convince, convince her not to go uh, further in her uh, thinking, but she was uh, convinced. Delille had owned a handgun for decades, a gift from a friend. He'd kept it hidden away in their home, but his wife knew where it was. She asked you to get your gun. Yes, she said, Jean, go and fetch the gun, load it for me and give it to me and leave me alone. Yes. Delille says after a long conversation with his wife, he went into his study and retrieved his Sterling 33 handgun. It was already loaded. He says he cocked the weapon and left it on the table beside her. Why did you do that? Why? Because uh, Nicole was miserable. Nicole wanted to end her life because I loved her and I realized that she wasn't happy anymore. When you left the gun on the table yes. and you prepared to leave your home, what, what were your last words to her? I said, Nicole, uh, please, Nicole, think about what you just said. Or think about what you want to do. Think, at least, Nicole, before doing anything. Think, think of your children, think of me. We're still, everyone will still love you, will with you. I pleaded with her. Hmm? And what did she say to you? She said, Jacques, leave me alone, leave me alone, give me one hour. When she said, give me one hour, that gave me some sort of uh, hope, that some sort of hope. So when you left your home, did you believe that she was going to pull the trigger? No. Well, at least, at least I was hoping that Nicole wouldn't do it. But I uh, asked myself, am I doing the right thing? Around 9.30 that morning, Delille says he left to run errands, believing his wife would not use the gun. A security camera at a local deli recorded him buying two salads, one for Nicole and the other for their daughter, Hélène, who was coming for lunch. Within the hour, he returned home. I opened up the door and I saw Nicole on the couch uh, with a lot of blood uh, on her face. I rushed to her and... Uh, I... Uh, I rushed to her and I, I kneeled and I wanted to put my hand on her chest because there was too much blood on her face. And I said, Nicole, Nicole, what did you do, Nicole? And at that time, there was, she was gone. Oh, yes, oh, yes, oh, yes, oh, yes, no doubt, yes. After her burial, I almost every day went to uh, pay a visit to the cemetery. And often, I asked Nicole, uh, did I do the right thing? <laughs> of course, of course, it's easy now. Now that I've been convicted, it's easy to say, no, I didn't, think the, I didn't do the right thing, eh? <laughs> you understand what I mean? It means knowing that I would, I would be convicted, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have done it. But at the time, you thought it was the right thing. I, well, at the, at the time, I was answering 
a Nikol's request. And I think that I did the right thing. But he admits he didn't do the right thing when police arrived on the scene. DeLil told them his wife got the gun on her own. Now I realize, uh, of course, I realize today that uh, I did a stupid thing, but uh, it's done. There isn't anything I can do about it now. Why did you lie to the police? Because I didn't want the family uh, to know what really happened that morning. I didn't want the family to know that I helped Nicole commit suicide. Even through his trial, he kept this secret as long as he could. But to beat his murder charge, DeLille knew he'd have to confess to the lesser crime of assisted suicide. First, he had to let his family know what he'd done. He asked his lawyer, Jacques Larochelle, to speak to his children. When I told Delane that he had loaded, fetched, and cocked a gun and given it to her, uh, her mother, she was completely upset. She was, she was in a terrible state. She left uh, the, the office uh, uh, almost crying, and, and it was worse with Dominique, his uh, daughter-in-law. They were devastated. It was terrible for her. They had been lied to. The police had been lied to. He had remitted. Uh, uh, a loaded gun to their mother, they were, they were shocked. The night before DeLille was scheduled to testify, his daughter-in-law, Dominique, went to his home. On behalf of the family, she begged him not to testify, begged him to keep his explosive secret to himself. I, I was concerned about the fact that our children, that everyone would learn the next Monday that he finally helped killing not killing, but help her or accept what she wanted. He agreed to what she wanted. But it was the truth. You know, when you go through things like this, you don't really think about what you should do or what's right to do. It was just the way we lived it day by day. I it was a right. terrible, uh, it's a tragedy. It's a family tragedy. And I think a family tragedy, you don't really think what's good or bad. You live it. I understand today that it was the truth and it should have been done. But at that moment, I felt I needed to tell him that it would impact us. Faced with the pleadings of his family, DeLille made a pivotal decision. She insisted upon uh, not telling things that will afflict any more on the family. That's that's the main reason, the only reason why I didn't testify. Now I realize it was a mistake, but it's too late. As a former judge, oh. do, you, do you think that was a smart legal decision to make? That was, a, that was not a smart decision to make. That was a sentimental decision I made. I thought of my family first. You know, people will say, Monsieur DeLille, you lied to the police. <laughs> you, you didn't tell the truth to your family for uh, a long time. I know where you're going. So no. why should we believe you today? <laughs> because I'm telling the truth today. It's as simple as that. But you know that everyone in this prison says they're innocent too. There are innocent persons in prisons. You have one in front of you. This is DeLille's version of what happened on that fateful day. But what story does the evidence have to tell? When we come back, a team of forensic experts weighs in on the case against the judge. It was the Crown's job to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that it was a case of murder. You have doubts. Yes, I do. There's reasonable doubt here. Jacques DeLille's life sentence for murdering his wife sent shockwaves through legal circles across the country. He's the first judge in Canadian history to ever be convicted of first-degree murder. So it's no surprise the case caught the eye of a lawyer in Toronto 
who's made history himself. James Lockyer rights, wrongs, and changes lives. His high-profile work has helped exonerate more than 20 people wrongly convicted of serious crimes. Some who spent decades falsely accused, like Stephen Truscott. The attorney who made his name taking on judges is now fighting for one, Jacques Delisle. This, see, this is what I had thought was the angle. Like With the help of his team at the Association in Defense of the Wrongfully Convicted, Lockyer poured over the trial testimonials, of the head. combed through the forensic evidence, and interviewed Delille and his family. So it's coming in like that. Yeah. I'm wondering why you want to take on this case. I try and take on cases where I think uh, that the people I'm helping are genuinely innocent. And uh, I think... Uh, uh, Monsieur de Lille is genuinely innocent. You've made a career out of proving judges wrong. How do you feel about defending one now? It really doesn't bother me at all. You know, one of the things that uh, I, can, uh, I can say that to judges even now, that you could be the next one. There are no potential exceptions to people who can be wrongly convicted. Right or wrong, here's the case that convicted de Lille. For the Crown, their forensic case seemed as basic as connecting the dots. First, the trajectory of the bullet that killed Nicole Rainville. The Crown said it took a straight path from her temple through her skull. They would determine the shot was fired at an angle of 30 degrees, consistent with someone holding a gun to the front of her head. These images show the Crown's team of experts demonstrating how they thought it happened. Then the next piece of the puzzle that black smudge found on her left hand. The Crown argued she got the burn as she raised her hand to defend herself from her husband. The pieces of evidence seemed to fit lock tight. However, the defense presented a completely different scenario. On the surface, the defense theory of how Ranville shot herself did seem far-fetched. Their one expert said the right-handed woman, who was partially paralyzed on her right side, used her left hand to grip the gun like this, upside down, using her middle finger to pull the trigger. The Crown said this was unrealistic, and the jury agreed. But Lockyer says juries are often swayed by faulty science. He, he was convicted on, on, on what I would consider to be very poor forensic evidence, um, and that's a, a common cause of, of wrongful convictions. Two dramatically different versions of the death of Nicole Rainville. So we took the evidence to our own independent forensic experts, three different experts in three different cities. They spent days poring over trial transcripts and photos of the evidence. None of them were consulted on this case before now. None of them discussed the evidence with each other. Which is, so this is the trigger figure. Dr. Peter Markestein is the former chief medical examiner of Manitoba, a forensic pathologist who's worked on cases of the wrongfully convicted before. He was shocked when he read the Crown's theory. There is zero forensic evidence to support that. This is the bullet, this is flattened. Right? Rather than start here with the bullet, Marcus Stein starts here with the entry wound. An angled shot would have left burn marks on the victim's skin and hair, but he says there are none. So he concludes the shot wasn't fired at a 30-degree angle, more like a perpendicular or 90-degree angle consistent with the suicide theory. There is no doubt from a scientific point of view that this was a perpendicular held gun at the time of firing. That seems clear cut. It is, yes. But it may be technical to a jury. That's the problem. Right. Right. But if the gun were at a 90 degree angle pointed at her temple, how then did the bullet end up in the back of her skull? Easy, says Liam Hendricks. He's a ballistics and firearms specialist recognized by the International Criminal Court in The Hague. This is a contact shot that struck hard bone. The bullet would have immediately started to fragment and deform upon impact with the skull. And so he says the bullet deflected as it hit inside the victim's skull, leaving a telltale trail of lead fragments. There was uh, x-ray evidence. 
which indicated what's known as a lead snowstorm, and that's the fragmentation of the projectile. The x-ray showed the lead snowstorm running roughly parallel across the head from point A to point B where they came to rest. He says it's evident the bullet went from the left temple, ricocheted off the right side of the head, and ended up at the back of the head. Once again, consistent with the defense, contradicting the crown. That's at the back of the head. And here we see so why did the crown experts interpret the evidence differently? Well, there's obviously always human error, and that can always play a role in any type of examination or examinations of these, this type and this type of complex case. That leaves one key piece of evidence, that telltale black powder burn on the victim's hand. To learn more about that, we asked Dr. Michael Schrum to unlock the secrets of the smudge. The powder on the hands and significance of that, that's what I'm trying to understand. Can we take a look at that? Sure. Shrum is an expert in forensic pathology who leads the autopsy team at the Health Sciences Centre in London, Ontario. He's testified for the defence in other murder cases. Okay, so again, what do you, what do you see there? Okay, so again, we have this uh, this uh, large area of uh, soot or smoke that's been expelled from the with the bullet. This powerful post mortem image is the key, he says, to understanding what really happened to Nicole Rainville. He said if she had put her hand up to defend herself from the gun, as the Crown said she did, the powder burns would have been on a different part of her palm. These burns, in this pattern, indicate she was likely holding the gun herself. This does appear to be consistent with a self-inflicted wound. It appears to be, yes. Well, that's significant. Yes, it is. I mean, that's the difference between guilt and innocence. That's right. All of our experts agree, based on the entry wound to her skull, the bullet's trajectory and the soot pattern on her hand, the Crown's forensic testimony, as presented at trial, is dead wrong. Because it was the Crown's job to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that it was a case of murder. You have doubts. Yes, I do. There's reasonable doubt here. Reasonable doubt about the guilt of a man who's already spent three years of a life sentence behind bars for murder. So we presented the questions raised about the Crown's forensic evidence to Charles Levasseur, the Crown attorney who originally took on the case. You cannot do uh, 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 evidence picking. I mean, right. you, have to, you have to consider the, the, whole, the whole story. Levasseur remains convinced DeLille pulled the trigger because of the compelling motive, the mistress and the ailing wife. He didn't want to, get to, to have this burden on his back at his retirement. He, want to he, he wants to travel. So that's my theory, and that's what I think, and I, that's what I still think and That, that hasn't today. changed? No, absolutely not. And it's not just Levasseur's opinion. The Quebec Court of Appeal and the Supreme Court let DeLille's conviction stand. Despite all those setbacks, Judge DeLille still has faith in the law. I'm, I'm confident in the justice system. When we come back, one last desperate attempt to prove his innocence. For inmates serving a life sentence at the saint anne des plaines Penitentiary, it's hard to dream about the future. Their lives are now defined and confined by their past. Jacques Delille has now spent three years here, plenty of time to think about the biggest case the former judge ever faced, being found guilty of murdering his wife, Nicole Rainville. Were you going into that trial confident that you would be acquitted? Yes, no doubt that I was going confident because I didn't kill Nicole. I said it's impossible for uh, uh, 12 jurors to uh, find me uh, criminally responsible for an act that, in, that I did not commit. During the trial, his defense lawyer, Jacques La Rochelle, was confident the jury would be swayed by the forensic evidence too not the sordid details of DeLille's private life. At the beginning, it was a normal case, and it was reported normally, and, and the more it went, and the more I felt 
an incredible hostility to him. And everybody told me, you will lose this case. He's certainly guilty. Everybody had his opinion. And when I asked them, what do you answer to this argument of ballistics? Ah, oh, it doesn't care about ballistics. It's not a case of ballistics. He had a mistress, he had money, he was a judge. So there was an amount of prejudice, of blind hate, that to me again today is completely uh, impossible to explain. Dalil can't explain it either. He feels the jury punished him for having an affair with his former secretary, Joanne Plamondon. Do you think that they were swayed by the fact that you were having a relationship with Madame Plamondon? If, if it was uh, one of their arguments, it's stupid because I'm not the first person to have an extramarital affair. That didn't necessarily make you a murderer. That wasn't a no, motive. No, that wasn't a motive. I love Nicole. I love Madame Plamondon. DeLille's legal options are now razor thin. After the Quebec Court of Appeal and the Supreme Court refused to reopen his case, there's only one last hope. Convicted prisoners in Canada who've lost all legal appeals are allowed by law to make a direct appeal to the federal justice minister, asking the government to reopen the case. But it's a long shot. In the past five years, there have been 72 requests to the minister. Only two were granted. Back in Toronto, DeLille's new defence lawyer, James Lockyer, is confident he can do it. He's convinced Ottawa to reopen several high-profile wrongful conviction cases in the past, but not without a fight. These cases are never easy. You're fighting against a presumption of guilt, of course, because he's been convicted by a jury uh, and had his appeals dismissed, so you are fighting against a presumption of guilt. He hopes to fight that presumption of guilt by having an independent scientific lab review the forensic evidence. Coupled with DeLille's stunning admission he helped his wife commit suicide, Lockyer thinks this new evidence should override a conviction he says was based on public anger and animosity. Uh, I understand there was a huge applause broke out when he was convicted. Um, my, my own sense, and, and I've experienced this in other cases, is that as human beings, we sometimes, we take delight in how the mighty have fallen. You've got to get the right people first. You've got to get someone who committed a crime before you do that. And I don't think Mr. DeLille, for a moment, committed a crime. Not, at least not the crime of murder. He did commit some crimes, but not the crime of murder. Yeah. Back inside the walls of the maximum security penitentiary, all DeLille can do now is wait. Will the judicial system that he served for so long give him a last chance to prove his innocence? He's no murderer, he says, but he confesses he is guilty of helping his wife die. Legally speaking, it's a crime, but that didn't cross my mind that morning. That morning I was acting out of love of Nika. I pleaded for her not to do so. I did the best I could to convince her, I told her that I loved her, that I was willing to spend the rest of my life. Take... Taking care of her. That's it. But, of course, subjectively or legally speaking, uh, it's an offense. I won't deny you. Every day he relives that November morning three years ago and the decisions that would end his wife's life and condemn him to a life sentence behind bars. I did the stupid thing. I grant you that I did the stupid thing. But it's easy after it's easy after to say that, right? Mm -hmm. But you had to be me that morning. Me that morning was a guy who didn't kill Nicole. Me that morning was a guy who was demolished by what he had seen. And you can't change the past. No, no. Mm. Now we'll see about the future. Mm.